For more on the situation in Egypt, I'm joined by Ari Ratner, a former U.S. State Department official and currently with the Truman Project on national security. Ari, why don't I start with some competing narratives today? The Interior Minister saying that uh, 36 Brotherhood members died uh, during this incident where it was apparently a prison breakout, and yet a legal source is telling Reuters uh, the, the men died from asphyxiation in the back of a crammed police van. So we're getting a lot of conflicting information. We know that journalists have also been kind of under attack in the last week or so. It, it, what do you make of this, these different pieces of information coming from different sides? Well, it's a pleasure being with you today, and, and there's an old saying that truth is one of the first casualties of any conflict, and I don't want to say this is a civil war by any stretch yet, but this is clearly a period of immense conflict uh, that is potentially just beginning in Egypt, and it's clear that both sides have an interest, and indeed all sides have an interest in, in getting their narrative out and disrupting the narrative of others, and that's why you see such targeting of journalists, that's why you see such not only competing narratives, but really competing realities, and that reflects the underlying real split in Egyptian society that this conflict is emerging out of. EU diplomats meet tomorrow in Brussels. They've got about six billion U.S. dollars that they can use as leverage, loans, and different uh, venues. Can they leverage something? Can they put pressure on this government? Will they listen to that type of pressure, do you think? It's, it's a very important question. It's something that diplomats across the Western world and indeed across the entire world are, are looking at. I think the reality is Aid like that certainly buys some leverage, but we shouldn't exaggerate how much leverage it does buy. It buys the ability to talk, it buys the ability to influence, but it by no stretch buy it buys the ability to control, particularly when Egypt is getting, or soon to be getting, uh, such sums of money from, from key allies now like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab, em Arab Emirates, that EU and U.S. aid really goes down in significance. Well, and that, that, I had another analyst on recently say, look, if, if the U.S. yanks that, they have no leverage. Uh, so it, you, I think the, the West finds themselves in this bind where they, it's kind of, they want to take it away or they, they want to use it as a threat. And yet, as you point out, uh, there's this backstop. They've got other allies that will fill the void, correct? There's, there's not only that other people will fill that void and therefore the U.S. or the EU will lose influence. It's, it's once you do that, it's going to be very difficult to ever put it back on the table, particularly in the difficult budget situations here in America and, and in Europe as well. So that's a move they want to do uh, in extremis. They, they may be approaching that move sometime soon, but they don't want to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. You worked at the State Department. You know what it's like to huddle in these meetings and try and hash out and brainstorm. What kind of brainstorming is going on right now? I mean, there aren't a lot of great options, are there? There's certainly no great options on the table. I think that's one of the, the most difficult things of being in policy making. It is a very difficult situation. It's very difficult to get proper information, even on intentions. And I think this is something that's going to be an iterative process going forward. Back in uh, 2011, Ellis Goldberg wrote a piece of, after Mubarak left office uh, that Egypt's military would not embrace democracy, and he called it Mubarakism without Mubarak. Is that what we're seeing now, do you think? I, I think that's certainly one way of looking at it. I, I, I'd look at it in terms of coalition. The military certainly is looking out for the interests of military, but there are many people uh, from a few different key factions who are supporting the military. You have secularists who are anti-Muslim Brotherhood, you have nationalists who are pro-military in and of themselves, you have people who are ideologically opposed uh, to the Brotherhood for a variety of reasons, and they all fall under the banner of this government. The military itself certainly is not a liberal military, uh, very few militaries are, and certainly has interests to protect. It's conceivable over the long term that there might be a more democratic order in which they play a significant part, but clearly they're not going to be the group of Egyptians leading that. Do you think it's likely they will ban the Muslim Brotherhood? I think it's a very difficult decision that they're going to have to make. I, I don't know whether they're ultimately going to come to that conclusion. If you had asked me last week, I would have said no. Now I think it's more likely. But I can tell you this. If they do ban the Muslim Brotherhood, there's very little likelihood that any ban will be meaningful and successful. The Muslim Brotherhood has been banned before. It certainly represents a significant portion of Egyptian society, 25, 30, 35 percent. Uh, and you can't simply outlaw a movement like that. And it's, in fact, it's a dangerous game because if you take away their leadership, a very top, heavy down organization, it's unclear who will be making decisions for them. How do you, once it starts to unravel, as it obviously is, how do you stitch it back together? I mean, how do, where does Egypt go now? Yeah, it, it's a very difficult situation. I think it's also important to keep it in perspective. You know, Egypt is going through significant uh, uh, conflict right now, but it's nothing on the order of what's happening in Syria or even what's happened in Libya. So we're not at that stage yet, and I think there is some good news in Egypt. Egypt is a 5,000-year-old civilization. You know, it's been along the banks of the Nile River for quite a long time, and it, it's likely to rebound over the long term. I mean, it's in a geographically important uh uh, location. It's got uh, entrepreneurial people. There's a lot of talent there. 
uh, this political situation has to be resolved, a number of the underlying crises, like their economic crisis or their education crisis, the role of women, all those are issues that will take quite a long time to, to redress, but it's not clear to me that they can't redress them in the next you know, period of time, 5, 10, 20 years. It'll take a while, but it could improve. You mentioned Syria, you mentioned Libya. Uh, do you think Egypt has, if a couple of wrong turns are made, that they can go in that direction? And how do you keep it from not making those wrong turns? Well, you know, Syria is, I mean, I think to keep perspective, more than 100,000 Syrians have been killed. And, and certainly what the Egyptian military just did was was, was, was quite horrific. But, but it starts but somewhere, say, as you it, well it, know. It, it, does, it does start somewhere. I, I think, you know, I wouldn't say a couple wrong turns. I think it's a, a couple wrong choices. Uh, the reality is both sides now have choices to make. The government has choices to make. The Brotherhood has choices to make. It's in no one's interest for this to deteriorate. Uh, it might be in people's short-term interest to, to attack the other side, but the reality is everyone would suffer. As a guy who watches this uh, on, on a regular basis, who worked at the State Department, what are you looking for? What are the telltale signs you'll look for in the next couple of weeks? I, I think it's important to, to see whether this really escalates quickly or whether everyone has cooler heads that prevail. You know, from the government's perspective, I'd look at, you know, are they going to limit this to just the top couple hundred Brotherhood officials or are they going to continue to crack down on protests? That will be a, a clear signal. It will also be a clear signal to see how other countries, not just the U.S. and the EU, but, you know, the Israelis in a quiet way, the Saudis and the Emiratis in a quiet way, how they deal with the government, uh, how China deals with the government will be important as well, uh, Russia as well. Um, from the perspective of the Brotherhood, I think it's important that they keep, um, you know, keep a, a lid on, on the more radical me members who may want to be pursuing attacks against the interior police or, or against Coptic churches. And if you see how the, the leadership of the Brotherhood talks, that'll be very important. Ari Ratner, thank you for your insights. Appreciate Pleasure. it.